you for joining us. And welcome, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey. Welcome to this place where we believe that you are a child of God and a gift to the world. Welcome to Pilgrim Church in Harwich Port with its strong faith tradition and conviction that the Bible is relevant for our lives today. I'm Susan Cardmel. All month, our services will explore the theme of hope. Our hope has certainly been tested in 2020, and this holiday season, many of us will be hard pressed to keep our hopes up with all the changes and all the sadness. Following this election and throughout the summer, our streets have been full of people expressing raw emotion. Many calling for change. Many expressing outrage. Some threatening violence. This unrest seemed to compound the challenges of 2020. As protesters called for justice or questioned policing or questioned the election results, many people recoiled, afraid of this confusion. But in the Bible and throughout history, we have always had prophets. Often they reminded us that unrest can be a sign of hope. Our services are broadcast on Facebook, on YouTube, and on our website, pcchp.org. And you can always share them on your Facebook page. This afternoon at the church, we'll have a gathering on the church lawn with Christmas cookie sale, some holiday music, and a chance to tour the sanctuary, which is decorated for Christmas. We hope you'll join us at four. Please wear a mask. And now, let us come into God's presence with a song.
This is the season of Advent in our church, and it's a time when we do a collective countdown to Christmas. It's a time when we prepare for God's gift to us in this holy season, the gift of a baby born in a manger, the gift of a child destined to become the light of the world. This week, we light our second of four candles. Last week, we lit the candle of hope, our hope that God hears us and cares about our world. Today, we light the second candle, the candle of peace. In a time when people search for personal peace and we hear so much about violence, we light this candle and ask that Christ's teachings fill our soul and bring comfort and serenity. I want you to join me and light candles each week. You can pause the service and find some candles at home so that you can light your two candles, one for hope and one for peace. And now, let us pray. Surprising God, kindle a sense of anticipation in each of us this day. As the season of Advent continues, we hold out hope for a new awakening in us and in our world. In an age when people seldom find personal peace, we light a fire and renew our hope for wholeness. And today we pray for something more than just the absence of conflict, but a sense of contentment in which all people thrive. Help us, O oh God, to be at home with ourselves. When there are conflicts around us in family, or feuds that have become internalized in us. Help us, O oh God. Help us to remember that peace based on injustice only postpones the conflict. And help us to work for true peace. Gracious God, bless our Advent waking, waiting Fill us with determination to work for your reign on earth. As a society, school us in the ways of peace. Bless our efforts to listen to our enemies, to find common ground, to search for agreement, to lay our weapons down. We ask, O oh God, that you bless our nation's prisons today. Protect our fellow citizens, all 2.5 million of them who live behind bars. Help us to work for pathways to justice that treat mental illness compassionately, that grant real justice, that restore people to productive jobs that bring pride and hope. As people with resources ourselves inspire us to use our privilege to insist on equality and a peace in our nation that will last. We are more than ready for a sign of hope this year. We are more than ready for a gift from you, Holy One. We are more than ready for some new light. We pray that you might kindle hope, new hope, in us in this season of waiting. In Christ's name, we pray all of this and more 
as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are grateful for your generous support of Pilgrim Church. If you normally give during worship, now's a good time to make your gift. And if you're new to Pilgrim Church and hear something today that inspires you and you want to support this ministry, we appreciate your support. You can donate now on Facebook or on the homepage of the website pcchp.org. If you prefer to mail your contributions, you can always send them to Pilgrim Church, 533 Route 28, P.O. Box 247, Harwichport, Massachusetts, 02646. We really appreciate your generous support, especially now. This December, our sermons are all about hope. And today, we'll look at the prophetic tradition in the Bible. In both the Old and New Testaments, prophets disrupted things. But the Bible respects that. 
Today's sermon is entitled, Is There Hope in Unrest? The sermon lesson comes from Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it was written about in the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. John's preaching starts when John the Baptist was in the wilderness, calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, one stronger than I am is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John's been called the Doberman Pincher of the Bible. He's ferocious, but he appears in every Christmas story. And each year before Christmas, we have to deal with John. We have to navigate this tricky story when all we want to do is dress up a little, wrap our presents, and settle in for the predictable tale of the birth of Jesus. But instead of a cozy Christmas message, we get John. Ferocious John, independently living in the wilderness on wild honey and locusts. Living in a cave overlooking the Dead Sea. For John, every day was a bad hair day. But there's something about John that's very important. He's the one God chose to announce the birth of Jesus. He's the one at the gate to the door of Christmas. The herald of good tidings is John. So we need to take a closer look at John and see who he was and why his message is the Rosetta Stone for all that's coming. At Christmas. In the first place, John says that sometimes the hardest things in life have the potential to be the most hopeful. See, John chose hardship so he could grow close to God. He gave up his home, volunteered for a hard life so he could grow in his spirit. He sensed that creature comforts would foil his ability to find faith. So he found his human potential by sacrificing so many other things we take for granted. And then John started to preach by the River Jordan, and people listened because his words made sense. He invited them not to join him in a cave, but to make an honest assessment of their lives, to take an inventory of their souls, to nurture their prayer life. It was a hard life that he had, but it brought him a certain satisfaction. Through it, he found his faith, And then he found his voice. They say the night is darkest before the dawn. 
They say that labor is hardest just before the baby's about to be born. They say that teenagers are most rebellious just before they make a firm step into adulthood. There's a classic psychology study on happiness. It compares two groups of people, people who've won the lottery and people who've been in car accidents that left them partially or completely paralyzed. When comparing happiness in these groups, most people expected the lottery winners to be content and the accident victims to be miserable. But the opposite was true. Most lottery winners just had more money and they didn't know where they were and they weren't more satisfied than before. But even more surprising was that the accident victims who'd learned something were full of hope. Having survived their trauma, they felt resilient. Many found new purpose in life, even with their limitations. So there's a clue here about why John is at the start of the Advent season. Because he reminds us that there's more to the birth of Jesus than just a cozy baby in a manger. When God comes close at Christmas, God gives of God's own self. Such a gift, such an astounding gift, calls for our response. And there's more to preparing for the holiday than just ribbons and wrapping paper or even family gatherings. Maybe, ironically, this Christmas, with so many of its normal routines stripped away, we can contemplate the spiritual depth at the heart of the birth of Jesus and what this gift means to us. Yet the Bible says people were always attracted to John's honesty because they felt that because all of he'd been through gave him integrity. He somehow redefined odd, but you could trust him to tell the truth. The Bible says he's important. Of the four Gospels, no one omits John the Baptist. They don't all have the story about Bethlehem, but they all talk about John. So there's something in his life and the honest way he talks about hope that gives us a sense of the depth of it. And secondly, sometimes hope is born when there's nothing left to lose. John exemplified that. John was born to privilege. His father served as high priest in the Jerusalem temple. He was an only child on top of that, and he would have been a shoe in for a place of honor. The best schools, the finest circles, the most influence of anyone. Instead, he left all that and lived like a monk, a Rastafarian, a reclusive prophet out in the wilderness. He voluntarily walked away from all his privileges in a radical attempt to pray without interruption, to avoid the distractions of success, to find God. And in the process, he also found a steely kind of courage that comes with losing so much. With nothing left to lose, like the people in the experiment on happiness. He didn't care what people thought. 
So he spoke the truth. He shot from the hip. He faced things head on. He'd long since given up, given up on pleasing people. So he said what he thought. And that's why people trusted him. That's why he earned a reputation for integrity. That's why people found hope in his message. When a Boeing 737 went down off the coast of Indonesia last year, the company said it was just faulty software. And then when another jet went down in Ethiopia, five months later, the Boeing company claimed another software malfunction. But then when COVID hit and planes everywhere were grounded, airline executives had a come to Jesus meeting to examine the corporate culture at Boeing that rewarded profit over safety. Only then were changes made. That reckoning was hard, but ultimately hopeful. It may help repair Boeing's damaged reputation. Better yet, it may make air travel much safer for the rest of us. Ironically, this pandemic has brought us to our knees as a nation. But it's also set the stage for a much more honest reckoning with our history and with our contemporary experience of racism. As hard as it was to watch the death of George Floyd, many people, Americans of every color, emerged from their lethargy. And I think it was connected to the pandemic. After weeks of imagining what it might be like to be a patient with COVID-19 and unable to breathe, here was an able-bodied man in that same situation. And then there were so many other examples of people who'd been sacrificed for no reason. People for whom there was not real justice. And suddenly, Americans took to the streets to protest night after night all summer long. Some people looted, but most demonstrations were peaceful as people raised their voices about racism. The cries went out around the world as nation by nation, we human beings all caught in this pandemic, without much left to lose, came to our own come to Jesus moment. Some people find the unrest itself upsetting, but I see it as a hopeful thing. Protesters have not given up on the vision of a land of equal opportunity and fair justice. Their message, just like every protest movement, comes from a place of hope. And finally, John the Baptist calls us to begin anew. When he preached by the River Jordan, John invited his listeners to be baptized. Go into the water and come out new. Start over as a newborn. Relinquish your old ways. You may call it sin. You just may call it bad habits. Give up your old ideas. All the things that haven't worked for you, your prejudices, everything in the past, what would it take to wipe some old slate clean and approach the rest of your life with fresh hope. If we really believe that God is coming in some new, barely recognizable form this Christmas, then we all have the potential to begin again. And then maybe we take a very different approach to the holiday this year. Maybe it's less frenetic more spiritual, more prayerful, 
more authentic. In the Jewish tradition, people clean their homes before the new year. They want to start over, both literally and figuratively. They don't want to bring last year's dust to this new calendar. John says, this is your chance to start over, to clean house, to begin afresh. As bad as 2020 has been, one of its gifts is the way it has shaken us and woken us up. Grateful to be alive, we survivors have a new sense of purpose about the future. Forced to live in a quieter world, we've become more prayerful. And John's challenge comes to us. How do you want to live? What do you want to worship? How do you intend to use your time? Now, let us pray. Make us more honest, O God, as we face the future. Help us to make the changes in ourselves that will make a lasting difference in our lives. Help us to find the kind of hope that has integrity and comes from you. Amen. Today, as we gather at this communion table, we remember a meal of hope that took place long ago. This meal took on such significance that whenever Christians meet to worship, they share the breaking of the bread and the, sh and the sharing of the cup. And those gestures, that sacrament formed the centerpiece of worship for centuries. Every time people broke this bread and drank this cup, the sacrament made such a difference and became a source of hope. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again ministering to you in Christ's name. We offer you this bread and cup.
And now, may the living Christ go with you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, and before you to show you the way. Amen.